Hi, everyone. We will start the encryption and AI session in just a minute. Um, it's the session with the half good and half bad pun, depending on how you look at it. Um, the perils of forcing encryption to say, aye, aye, captain. Uh, so we'll give it a minute for people to settle down. And we're waiting for one on-site speaker to join. But other than that, we're good to go. Could I request the organizers to help us see those speakers on the screen, the two speakers joining online? Oh, there we go. Hi, just to check, Rihanna, Sarah, can you hear us? Yes, great. Uh, do you want to try saying something so we can check if your audio is working? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Great. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. All right. So um, Udbhav will be joining us shortly, but maybe we can start just to make the most of time. Uh, my name is Namrata Maheshwari. I'm from Access Now, an international digital rights organization. I lead our global work on encryption, and I also lead our policy work in South Asia. I have the relatively easy task of moderating this really great panel, so I'm very excited about it. And I hope we're able to make it as interactive as possible, which is why this is a round table. So we'll open it up, I, hopefully halfway through, but definitely for the last 20 minutes. So if you have any questions, please do note them down. Well, quick introduction, and then maybe I'll do some context setting. I'll start with um, Ilishka Perkova on my left, um, who is also my colleague from Access Now. She is Senior Policy Analyst and Global Freedom of Expression Lead. And as a member of the European team, she leads our work on freedom of expression, content governance, and platform, ac platform accountability. Thank you so much for being here. I will introduce Udbhav anyway while we wait for um, him to come here. He is the head of global product policy at Mozilla, where he focuses on cybersecurity, AI, and connectivity. He was previously the public at the public policy team at Google and non-resident scholar with Carnegie Endowment. And online, we have um, Rihanna and Sarah. Rihanna Pfefferkorn is a research scholar at the Stanford Internet Observatory. A lawyer by training, her work focuses on encryption policy in the US and other countries and related fields such as privacy, surveillance, and cybersecurity. Sarah Myers-West is the managing director of AI Now Institute and recently served a term as a senior advisor on AI at the Federal Trade Commission. She holds a decade of experience in the field of the political economy of technology, and her forthcoming book, Tracing Code, examines the origins of commercial surveillance. Thank you so very much. Um, these are people who I believe have played a very important role in shaping the discourse around encryption and AI in recent times. So thank you so much for lending your insights and expertise to this panel. And thank you all for sharing your time with us here today. Well, we're seeing a lot of proposals across the world in different regions on AI and encryption. So this session really is an effort to shed some light on the intersections between the two, which we think lie um, within the content scanning proposals that we're seeing in different countries, US, UK, EU, India, and uh, Australia, a lot of others. These proposals mainly suggest scanning content of messages on encrypted platforms. And proponents say that there is a way to do this in a way that would not undermine privacy and help eliminate harmful material. And opponents say that there is an over-reliance on AI because the tools that would need to be developed to scan this content are AI tools, automated scanning tools, which are prone to biases, prone to, well, false outputs, and also that it would undermine privacy and erode into an encryption as we know it. So I'm hoping that the speakers on this panel can tell us more about it. Um, with that, I'll get us started. Just some housekeeping. Um, online, we have my colleague Reitz moderating. So whoever is joining online, if you have questions, drop them in chat, and Reitz will make sure we address those. Um, Rihanna, if I could start with you. Uh, proposals in many countries to moderate content on encrypted platforms are premised on the idea that it is possible to do this without undermining privacy. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about what the merits of this are, 
what the real impact is on encryption and on the user groups um, that use these platforms, including the groups that these proposals seek to protect? Sure. So there's a saying in English, which is that you want to have your cake and eat it too. And that's what this idea boils down to, the idea that you can scan encrypted content to look for bad stuff, but without breaking or weakening end-to-end -end encryption or otherwise undermining the underlying privacy and security guarantees uh, intended for the user. We just don't know how to do this yet, and that's not for lack of trying. Uh, computer security researchers have been working on this problem, but they haven't yet figured out a way to do this. So the tools don't exist yet, and it's doubtful that they will, at least in a reasonable time frame. You can't roll back encryption to scan for just one particular type of content, such as child sex abuse material, which is usually what governments want and encrypted apps to scan for. Um, if you're trying to scan for one type of content, you have to undermine the encryption for all of the content, even perfectly innocent content. And that defeats the entire purpose of using end-to-end -end encryption, which is making it so that nobody but the sender and the intended recipient can make sense of the encrypted message. This has been in the news lately because perhaps most prominently the United Kingdom government has been pretending that it's possible to square this particular circle. Um, basically the UK has been one of the biggest enemies of strong encryption for years now, at least among democracies. Uh, it's been trying to incentivize the invention of tools that can safely scan encrypted content through government sponsored tech challenges. And it just passed a law, the online safety bill that in engages in this same magical thinking that this is possible. Um, the issue here is that, like I said, there isn't any known way to scan encrypted content without undermining privacy and security. Um, and nevertheless, this new law in the UK gives their, uh, their regulator for the internet and telecommunications the power to serve uh, compulsory notices on encrypted app companies, forcing them to try and do just that. The regulator has now said, actually, okay, we won't use this power because they've basically admitted that like there just isn't a way to do this yet. They say we won't use that power until it becomes technically feasible to do so, which might effectively be quite a while because we don't have a way of, of making this technically feasible. And part of the danger of having this power in the law is that you know it's premised upon the need to scan for child sex abuse material, but there isn't really any reason that you couldn't expand that to whatever other type of prohibited content that a government might want to be able to find on a service, which might be anything that's critical of the government. It might be les majeste, it might be uh, content coming from a religious, religious minority, et cetera. Um, and so requiring companies to scan by undermining their own encryption for whatever content the government says they have to look for could put journalists at, at, at risk, dissidents, human rights workers, anybody who desperately needs their communications to stay confidential and impervious to outside snooping by malicious actors, which might be your own government, might be uh, somebody else who, uh, who has it in for you, even in cases of domestic violence, for example, or uh, you know, child abuse situations uh, within the home. So We've seen some at least positive moves in this area in terms of a lot of public pushback and outcry over this. Uh, several of the major makers of encrypted apps, including Signal, WhatsApp, which is owned by Meta, and iMessage, which is owned by Apple, have threatened to just walk away from the UK market entirely rather than comply with any compulsory notice telling them that they have to scan encrypted material uh, for child sex abuse content. Um, so... I take that as a positive sign that not only some of the major makers of these apps are saying that isn't something that we could do and that they're saying we would rather just walk away rather than undermine what our users have come to expect from us, which is the level of privacy and security that end-to-end -end encryption can guarantee. Thank you, Rihanna. Sarah, um, if you could just zoom out a bit for a second um, and there has been a lot of thought there have been a lot of thoughts about how artificial intelligence is a misleading term and it could lead to flawed policies because based on a misrepresentation of the kind of capabilities that the technology has um, do you think there is a better term for it and if so well what would it be and the second limb of the question was again there have been a lot of studies and debates around the inherent biases and flaws of AI systems. So if these were to be implemented within encrypted environments, 
which one of these characteristics, or if, if that's true, if that is something that would happen, would these be transferred to encrypted platforms in a way that would lead to, well, unique consequences? Sure, that's a, it's a great question. Um, I think it is worth taking a step back and really pinning down what it is that we mean by artificial intelligence, because that's a term that has meant many different things over an almost 70 year history. And it's one that's been particularly valuated um, in recent co um, policy conversations. You know, in the current, um, in, in the current state of affairs, um, No worries, maybe we can come back um, to Sarah once she rejoins. Reese, could you let me know when, when Sarah's back online? Oh, she's back, okay. Hi, Sarah, are I'm you I'm back, here? yes, sorry about that. No um, what, I, what I was about to say was, you know, what, what we sort of mean by artificial intelligence in the, in the present day moment is um, the application of statistical methods to very large data sets um, data sets that are often produced through commercial surveillance or through, you know, massive amounts of web scraping um, and uh, sort of mining for patterns within that uh, massive amount of data. Um, so it's essentially, a, you know, a foundationally computational process. But really, you know, what Brianna was talking about here was sort of surveillance by another means. Um, and I think a lot of value, you know, I, ideals get imbued onto what AI is capable of that don't, don't necessarily bear out in practice. You know, the FTC has recently described um, artificial intelligence as, you know, largely a marketing term. And there's a, a frequent tendency in the field to see claims about AI being able to, you know, serve certain purposes that lack any underlying validation or testing um, were, you know, within the field, uh, you know, benchmarking standards may vary widely. Um, and uh, very often companies are able to make claims about the capabilities of the systems that don't end up bearing out in practice. And we sort of discover them through auditing and other methods after the fact. Um, and to that point, you know, given that AI is essentially grounded in pattern matching, um, there is a you know very well documented phenomenon in which um, artificial intelligence is going to mimic patterns of societal inequality and amplifying them at scale. So we see widespread patterns of um, you know discrimination within artificial intelligence systems in which you know the harms accrue to um, populations that have. Um, historically um, been discriminated against and the benefits accrue to, uh, accrue to those who um, have experienced privilege. Um, and these, um, and that AI is sort of broadly being claimed to be some magical solution, but not necessarily with it, with, you know, robust independent checks that it will actually work as claimed. Thank you. Um, Ilishka, Given your expertise on content governance and the recent, re recent paper you led on content governance in times of crisis, could you tell us a bit about the impact of introducing AI tools or content scanning in encrypted environments in regions that are going through crisis? Sure, thank you very much. Um, and uh, maybe I also would like to start from a sort of a content governance perspective and what we mean by the danger when it comes to client side scanning and uh, weakening encryption, which is the main precondition for security and safety within the online environment, which of course becomes even more relevant when we speak about the regions impacted by crisis. Um, so, uh, but, but unfortunately these technologies are spreading also in uh, democracies uh, across the world and uh, legislators and regulators increasingly sell that idea that they will provide these magical solutions solutions uh, to ongoing um, very serious crimes such as uh, child sexual abuse materials but um, and I will get to that this also concerns other types of illegal content such as terrorist content or potentially even misinformation and disinformation that is spreading online on uh, encrypted spaces such as whatsapp or other uh, private messaging apps so um, of course there are a number of questions that must be raised when we discuss content moderation and content moderation 
evaluation has several phases. It starts with the detection of the content, of evaluation, assessment of the content, um, and then consequently, ideally, there should be also provided some effective access to remedy once there is the outcome of this process. And when we speak about end-to-end -end encryption violation and client-side scanning, the most kind of worrisome state is precisely detection of the content where these technologies are being used. Um, and uh, one very important, and this is usually done through different, using uh, hash technologies, um, different types of these technologies. Uh, photo DNA is quite known. Um, and of course, these technologies, I, and I very much like what Sarah mentioned, it's quite questionable whether we can even label them as artificial intelligence. I would rather go for machine learning systems in that regard. Um, and um, what is very essential to recognize here is that these technologies simply scan the content and they are usually used for identifying the content that was already previously identified as illegal content, depending on the category they are supposed to identify, and so then they trace either identical or similar enough content to that one that was already captured. And um, the machine learning system as such cannot particularly distinguish whether this is a harmful content, whether this is illegal content, whether this is the piece of this information, um, because this content, of course, doesn't have any technical features per se that would precisely provide this sort of information, which ultimately results into a number of false positives and false negatives and errors of these technologies that impose serious consequences on fundamental rights protection. So um, what I find particularly worrisome in this debate increasingly, and that's also very much relevant regarding the, the regions impacted by crisis, is the impact on significant risk and justifications that these type of technologies can be deployed if there is a significant risk to safety um, or to other you know, uh, significant risks that are usually very vaguely defined in these legislative proposals that are popping across the world. Um, and if they have these, if we have these risk-driven um, um, kind of, uh, I don't want to call it ideology, uh, but trend behind the regulation, then of course what will be significantly decreased is precisely the requirements for the rule of law and accountability, such as uh, that, for instance, these detection orders should be fully backed up by the independent judicial bodies, um, and they should be the ones who should actually decide whether something like that is necessary and conduct that initial assessment. And when we finally put it in the context of crisis, of course, in times when the rule of law is weakened, either by authoritarian regime in power that seeks to use these technologies to crack down on decent human rights activists and defenders, and we as Access Now, being a global organization, we see that all over again, that this is primary goal of these type of regulations and legislations, or also these regimes being inspired by the democratic Western world, where these regulations are also probably profiling more and more, um, then of course consequences can be fatal. Number of extremely sensitive information can be obtained about human rights activists um, as a part of the broader surveillance campaign. And it also means that under such context where the state is failing and the state is the main perpetrator of violence in times of crisis, it is the digital platform and private companies who often act as a last resort of protection and access to any sort of remedy. And under those circumstances, not only that their importance increases, but so do their obligations and their responsibility to actually get it right. And that of course contains the due diligence obligation, so understanding what kind of envir environment they operate in and what they what is technically feasible and what is actually consequence if they, for instance, comply with the pressure and wishes of the government in power, which we often see, especially when it comes to informal cooperation between the government and platform. Um, that was a lot, so I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our Fourth speaker, Udbhav Tiwari, is having some trouble with his badge at the entrance. I don't know if the organizers can help with that at all, but he's at the venue, but just having trouble getting a copy. So just a request, in case you are able to help, no worries if not. Um, he'll be here shortly, but in the meantime, we can keep the session going. Uh, Rihanna, I'd like to come back to you. A lot of the conversations and debates on this subject revolve around the very important question of, well, what are the alternatives? There are very real challenges in terms of online safety, harmful material online, 
and very real concerns around privacy and security. Um, so the question is, if not content scanning, then what? In that context, could you tell us more about your research on content oblivious trust and safety techniques and whether you think there are any existing or potential privacy preserving alternatives? Sure. So um, I published research in Stanford's own Journal of Online Trust and Safety uh, in early 2022. Um, there's a categorization that I did in this research, which is content dependent versus content oblivious techniques for detecting harmful content online. Um, content dependent means that that technique is re requires at will access by the platform to the contents of user data. Um, so some examples would be automated scanning for the DNA is an example or human moderators who go to look for um, content that violates the platform's policies against abusive abusive uses. Um, I would also include content client-side scanning, uh, as Elisco was describing, as a content-dependent technique because it's looking at the contents of messages uh, before it gets encrypted and, and transmitted to the recipient. Um, it, content oblivious, by contrast, means that the trust and safety technique doesn't need at will access to message contents or file contents in order to work. So examples would be analyzing data about a message rather than the contents of a message, so metadata analysis, as well as analysis of behavioral signals. How is this user behaving, even if you can't see the contents of their messages? Um, <clears throat> another example would be uh, user reporting of abusive content, because there, the reason that the platform gets access to the contents of something isn't because they had the ability to go and look for it, it's because the user chose to report it to the, to the platform itself. Um, so I conducted a survey in 2021 of online service providers, which included both end-to-end -end encrypted apps as well as other non-EDE types of online services. And I asked them what types of trust and safety techniques they use across 12 different categories of abusive content from child safety crimes to hate speech to spam to mis and disinformation and so on. And I asked them which of three techniques, automated content scanning, which is content dependent, and metadata analysis and user reporting, which are content oblivious, did they find most useful for detecting each of those 12 different types of abusive content? And what I found was that for almost every category, a content oblivious technique was deemed to be as or more useful than a content dependent one. Specifically, user reports in particular prevailed across many categories of abuse I asked about. The only exception was child sex abuse material where automated scanning was deemed to be the most useful, so meaning things like photo DNA. These findings indicate that and then encrypted services ought to be investing in making robust user reporting flows, ideally ones that expose as little information about the conversation as possible apart from the abusive incident. Um, I find user reporting to be the most privacy preserving option for fighting online abuse. Plus, once you have a database of user reports, you could apply machine learning techniques to users or groups across your service if you wanted to look for some trends um, without necessarily searching across the entire database of, of all content on the platform. Um, another option, metadata analysis. In my survey, that didn't fare as well as user reporting in terms of the usefulness as perceived by the providers, but that was a couple of years ago. And even then, the use of AI and ML were already helping to detect abusive content, so those tools surely have room to improve. Um, I do want to mention, though, like it's important to recognize that there are trade-offs to any of the proposals that we might come up with. Metadata analysis has major privacy trade-offs uh, compared to user reporting because the service has to collect and analyze enough data about its users to be able to do that kind of approach. There are some services like Signal that choose to collect extremely minimal data about their users as part of their commitment to user privacy. Um, so when we're talking about trade-offs, trade-offs might be in accuracy. There might be false positive rates or false negative rates associated with a particular option, uh, privacy intrusiveness, what have you. There's no abuse detection mechanism that is all upside and no downside. We can't let governors or vendors pretend otherwise, um, and especially when it comes to pretending that you're going to have all of the upside without any kind of trade-offs whatsoever, um, which is what I see commonly used like, oh yeah, it's worth these privacy trade-offs or these security trade-offs because we're going to realize this upside. Well, that's not necessarily a guarantee. But at the same time, I think that as advocates for civil liberties, for human rights, for strong encryption, it's important for us not to pretend that the things that we advocate as alternatives don't also have their own trade-offs. 
Um, there's a great report that CDT published in 2021 that looked at a bunch of different approaches called From the Outside Looking In. That's also a great resource uh, for looking at the different sorts of options in the end encrypted versus versus, you know, how, the tension between doing trust and safety and how to continue respecting strong encryption. Great. Um, Udbhav, we'll come to you now. Um, a lot of proposals, again, on content scanning are premised on the admittedly well-intentioned goal of wanting to eliminate harmful material online. From a product development perspective, do you think it is possible to develop tools that are limited to scanning certain types of content? And looking at the cross-border implications as well um, from a platform that provides services in various regions, what do you think the impact of implementing such abilities in one region beyond other regions with different kinds of governments and contexts? Thanks, Namita. Uh, I think that the first kind of angle to, with which to look at it is um, whether it's technically feasible or not. And the second is whether it's feasible in law and policy. And I think the both of them are um, two different answers. Uh, purely on the technical feasibility perspective, um, it depends on how one decides to define client-side scanning and, and what constitutes client-side scanning or not. But um, there are different ways in which platforms already do certain kinds of scanning for uh, unintended encrypted content that some of them claim can be done for encrypted content in a way that is reliable. But uh, personally speaking, and, and also from Mozilla's own experiences as we've evaluated them, it's quite difficult to take any of those claims uh, on face value because almost none of these systems, when they do claim to only detect a particular piece of content well, um, have gone, uh, I think, undergone the level of independent testing and, rig uh, and rigorous analysis that is required for those claims to actively be verified by the, like, by the rest of either the security community or the community that generally works in trust and safety like Rihanna was uh, talking about. And uh, the second aspect, which is the law and policy aspect, is I think the more worrying concern because it's very difficult to imagine a world in which we deploy these technologies for a particular kind of content, presuming it meets the really high bar of being reliable and trustworthy um, and also somehow privacy preserving. Um, the legal challenges that it creates don't end with uh, it existing, but of how other governments may be inspired by these technological capabilities existing in the first place. And that's because once these technological capabilities exist, various governments would want to utilize it for whatever content they may deem worth detecting at a given point in time. Um, and that means that what may be uh, CSAM material in one country may be CSAM material and terrorist content in another country, and in a third country it may be CSAM material, terrorist content, and content that maybe is uh, critical, say, of the political ruling class in that particular country as well. And um, as I think if there's one thing that we've seen with the way that the internet has developed over the last 20 to 25 years, it's that the ability of companies, and especially large companies, to be able to resist requests uh, or directives from governments has only reduced over time. Um, uh, the incentives against uh, them standing up against governments are uh, like very, very aligned towards them just complying with governments because it's simply much easier for you from a business perspective to be able to just if a government uh, places pressure upon you over an extended period of time to just give in to certain requests. And we've already seen examples of that happen um, uh, with other services that are ostensibly uh, parts of which are end-to-end -end encrypted, such as iCloud, where in certain jurisdictions they have separate technical infrastructures that they have set up because of requests from governments um, as well. So if it has started happening there, I see it. I think it's very difficult to see a world in which we won't see it happening for client-side scanning um, and these kinds of uh, content as well. One other thing that I will say there, and that's especially from a product development perspective, is um, Mozilla has also actually had some experience with this and the challenges that come uh, with uh, deploying end-to-end -end encrypted services um, and uh, deciding to do them in a privacy-preserving manner, but not uh, having uh, uh, and not collecting metadata, which was this service called Firefox Send. Uh, which Firefox uh, and Mozilla had originally created a couple of years ago uh, to be able to allow users to share files uh, easily and anonymously. So you went onto a portal, it had a very low limit. Um, you could upload a file onto the portal, and then once you uploaded a file onto a portal, you got a link, and then the individual could click on the link, and then you could download it. And uh, this the 
service worked reasonably well for a couple of years but what we realized um uh, I think towards the end of its lifespan was that there were also some use cases in which it was being used by malicious actors to actively deploy uh, harmful content. Uh, in some cases, malware. In some cases, uh, like materials that otherwise would be implicated in investigations. Um, and once we evaluated whether we could deploy uh, mechanisms that would either scan for such content on devices, which in our case was uh, the browser, which has even less uh, of a possibility of doing uh, such actions, uh, we decided that it was better for that uh, piece uh, of software to not exist rather than for it to create the risks that it did for users without the trust and safety uh, options that were available to us because it was end-to-end -end encrypted. So that's also, I think, a nod towards the fact that um, there are different streams and levels of use cases to which end-to-end -end encryption can be deployed and different kinds of trust and safety measures that could be deployed to uh, like account for different like threat vectors, if you would like to call them that way. Um, and the ones that we're specifically talking about, which is client-side scanning, um, uh, it most is most popular right now for messaging. But the way that it's actually been deployed in the past, or almost been deployed in the past by, say, a company like Apple, was the closest was actually scanning inform all information that would be present on a device before it would be backed up. Um, so there is, th and that's the final point that I'm making, that there's also this implication that we are presuming this is a technology that will only scan your content after you hit the send button or when you're hitting the send button. But uh, in most of the ways in which it's actually been deployed, it's been deployed in a way where it proactively would scan individuals' devices to detect content before uh, uh, it uh, before it is backed up or uploaded onto a server in some form. And that's a very, very thin line to walk between doing that and just keeping it, uh, and just like scanning content all the time in order to detect whether there's something that shouldn't exist on the device. And that's a very scary possibility. Thanks, Udbhav. Um, is Sarah online reads? I, I believe she's had an emergency, but that's fine. Uh, we'll come back to her if she's able to join again. Um, Ilishka, in many ways, the EU has been at the center of this discourse, or what is also known as the Brussels effect. We see a lot of um, policy proposals, debates, and discourses on internet governance and privacy and free expression traveling from the EU to other parts of the world. Also true for, hap it also happens horizontally across other countries, but uh, still in a disproportionate way from EU to elsewhere. Uh, more recently, there have also been proposals around looking at the question of content moderation on encrypted platforms. Uh, what would you say are the signals uh, from the EU for the rest of the world from a privacy, free expression, and safety perspective on what to do and what not to do? Thank you. Indeed, uh, uh, the EU regulatory race has been quite intense in the past few years, also in the area of content governance and platform accountability. Uh, specifically in the context of uh, client-side scanning, um, I'm sure many of you are aware of the still pending uh, proposal on child sexual abuse material. It's the EU regulation, which from the fundamental rights perspective is extremely problematic. Um, as a part of EDRI network, uh, there was EDRI position paper that contains the main uh, critical points around the legislation, and a couple of them I've already summarized during my first intervention. Um, and the whole entire regulation is um, problematic due to the disproportionate measure it imposes on the private actors from detection order and other measures that can be only implemented through technical solutions such as client-side scanning. Um, very short-sighted justifications for the use of this technology, uh, very much based on that risk approach that I've already explained at the beginning, uh, but also ultimately uh, not recognizing and acknowledging that uh, the use of such technology will also violate the prohibition of general monitoring because, of course, this technology will have to scan uh, the content indiscriminately. And I'm mentioning the, the ban on the general monitoring because if you ask me about the impact of the EU regulation, of course, another very decisive law in this area was uh, or is Digital Services Act, even though Digital Services Act regulates user-generated content disseminated for public if we speak about platforms, but to some minimum extent, we could say there are some minimum basic requirements for private messaging apps too, even though it's not the main scope of the Digital Services Act. But DSA has still a 
lot to say in terms of uh, accountability, transparency criteria, and other due diligence measures that these regulation contains. And we are really worried about the interplay between these horizontal uh, legislative framework within the EU and the ongoing um, still negotiated proposal, the proposed regulation, the child sexual abuse material. Um, if it would stay in its current form, and we are really not there yet, um, of course, there would be a number of issues that would be in direct violation with the existing Digital Services Act, especially those measures that stand on that intersection between these two regulations. And of course, this sends a very dangerous signal to other governments uh, outside the European Union, governments that will definitely abuse these kind of tools, especially if a democratic government within the EU will legislate legitimize the use of such a technology, which would ultimately happen, and we hope it won't, and there is a significant effort to prevent uh, these regulations from ideally not being adopted at all, which is probably at this stage way too late, but at least do as much damage control as possible. Um, so we have to see how this goes. But of course, the um, uh, emphasis on the regulation within the European Union around digital platforms in general is very strong. There was a number of other laws adopted in recent years. Um, and it will definitely trigger this Brussels effect that we saw in the case of the GDPR, but also in case of other member states within the EU, especially in the context of content governance, for instance, infamous Nets DG in Germany, where Justitia is running the report every year, where they clearly show how many different jurisdictions around the world follow the uh, regulatory approach um, and if it's coming directly from the European Union the situation will only get you know as much as I believe in some of those laws and regulations what they try to achieve um, everything in the realm of content governance and freedom of expression can be significantly abused if it ends up in the wrong hands and in the system that doesn't take their constitutional values and rule of law seriously thank you um Udbhav, my question for you is actually the flip side of my question for Ilishka. Given that so much of this debate is still dominated by um, regions in the global north, mostly the US, UK, and EU, uh, how can we ensure that the global majority plays an active role in shaping the policies and the contexts that are taken into account uh, when these policies are framed? And what do you think tech platforms can do better in that regard? Thanks, Namrata. Um, I think that, generally speaking, if we were to look at, uh, f just for the first maybe minute, uh, in the context of end-to-end -end encrypted messaging, uh, I would say that probably the only country that already has a law on the books that nobody's, like, at least the government doesn't seem to have made a direct connection between possibilities like client-side scanning and... Uh, regulatory outcomes is the Indian government because um, India currently has uh, a law in place that gives the government uh, the power to demand the traceability of uh, pieces of content um, in a manner that still preserves security and, and privacy. So we're not very, uh, I don't think it's too much of a stretch for say a government stakeholder in India to say, why don't we de develop a system where there's a model running on every device or a hash or a system that scans for certain messages on every device and the government provides hashes and then you need to be able to like essentially scan a message before it gets encrypted and reported to us uh, for whether it, um, uh, and if it is a match, it means that that individual is spreading you know, uh, messages that are either leading to like um, public order issues or other kinds of uh, misinformation that's spreading that they want to clamp down on. So, and the reason I kind of raise that even though traceability is not necessarily a client-side scanning issue is that I actually think that the conversation is uh, both a lot less nascent in the vast majority uh, of uh, the global majority conversations, but it's also uh, has a lot more potential to cause much more harm. Uh, and that's because a lot of these proposals both float under the radar, don't get as much attention internationally. Um, and ultimately, the only thing that holds uh, or protects the individuals in these jurisdictions is the willingness of platforms to comply with those regulations or not. Uh, because so far we... Uh, apart from the notable exception of China, where uh, 
in general there have been systems where the amount of control that the state has had on the internet has been quite different for long enough that there are alternative systems to the point at which I think that the only known system uh, uh, that I've read of that actually has this capability is the green dam filter. I think it's called in uh, China, which does have the ability to uh, was originally installed on, uh, and I think it's almost mandatory for it to be present on um, personal computers, uh, which was originally uh, recommended as a um, uh, filter for uh, pornographic websites and adult content. Uh, but there have been reports that since then it had uh, that it may have reported to governments when people have either searched for certain keywords or, or gone after or looked for content that uh, may not necessarily be approved um, uh, at that point as well. And I think that 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 shows that showcases that in some places the idea that client side scanning. Uh, may not be this hypothetical reality that will exist in the future but may already exist for some time and that uh, given the fact that we are only uh, relying for better or for worse on the will of the platforms to resist such uh, requests in, uh, before they end up being deployed I think that the conversation that we need to then start having is one what are the ways in which uh, uh, people outside these jurisdictions are actually holding platforms to account for when these measures get passed. So if they do get passed saying, do you intend to comply with it? If you don't intend to comply with it, um, uh, uh, what is your plan for if the government escalates uh, like its enforcement actions against you? And as we've seen in many countries in the past, like they can get pretty severe. And ultimately, uh, I think this is something that will need to be dealt with at a country to country level, uh, not necessarily platform to country level, because I think that ultimately, if depending on the value of the market for the business or for the strength of the market as a geopolitical power, the ability of a platform to rec resist demands from um, uh, a government uh, is ultimately limited. And they can try, uh, and some of them do, and many of them don't. But ultimately, it's something that only international attention and international pressure can reasonably uh, move the needle into. Um, the final point that I'll make there is uh, I do think that even when it comes to the development of these technologies, uh, these are still very much uh, very uh, like Western centric technologies where a lot of the models that they are trained on, a lot of the information these things are designed on um, come from a very different uh, like realm of information that may not really match up two pieces uh, in the global majority. Um, I have like read of numerous examples outside the end-to-end -end encrypted context where, uh, for example, something that a lot of platforms do is that they block certain keywords that are known to be secret keywords for CSAM, um, which are not very well known. Uh, and they are they vary radically in different jurisdictions. So uh, in order to find it, it may seem like an innocuous word that means something completely different in a local language. But if you search for that, you will find users and profiles that I where actually CSAM already exists. Um, and just finding out what those keywords are in various local languages in individual jurisdictions uh, is something that like many platforms take years to do be able to do well and that's not even an end-to-end -end encrypted or client-side scanning problem it's a how much are you investing in understanding local context how much are you uh, un uh, investing in understanding local realities problem um, and uh, if that happens there i think that like it's because those measures fail it's because when it comes to uh, unencrypted content uh, that platforms don't act quick enough or don't account for local context enough, that governments uh, also end up resorting to measures like recommending client science scanning. That's by no means to say that it's the fault of these platforms that these measures or these ideas exist, but there's definitely a lot more that they could do in the global majority to actually deal with the problem on open systems where they actually have a much better record uh, of enforcement in English um, and in uh, countries outside the global majority than within the global majority. Thank you. I have one last question for Sarah, and then we'll open it up to everybody here and if anybody is attending online. Um, so please feel free to jump in after that. Um, Sarah, as our AI expert on the panel, um, what would your response be to government proposals that treat AI as a sort of silver bullet that will solve problems of content moderation on encrypted platforms? So I think one thing that's become particularly clear over the years is that content moderation is in many respects an almost intractable problem. And though AI 
may present as though a, a very attractive solution, it's in many ways, it's not a straightforward one. Um, and in fact, it's one that introduces new and likewise troubling problems. Um, AI for you know all of its many benefits, it remains imperfect and there's a need for um, considerably more scrutiny on claims that are being made by vendors, um, particularly given the current state of affairs where you know quite few models are being going through any sort of very rigorous independent verification or adversarial testing. I think there are concerns about harms to privacy. Um, there are concerns about false positives that could sort of paint um, innocent people as culprits and lead to unjust consequences. And uh, lastly, you know, there's been research that has shown that malicious actors can manipulate content in order to bypass these automated systems. And this is an issue that's endemic across AI um, and underscoring you know, even further the need for much more rigorous standards for independent evaluation and testing. So before you know, we, we put all of our um, eggs in one basket, um, so to speak, I think it's really important to one, evaluate whether AI, broadly speaking, is up for the task, and then two, um, to really look under the hood and get a much better um, picture of what kinds of evaluation and testing are needed to you know, verify that, in fact, um, these AI systems are working as intended because, by and large, the evidence is, is indicating that they're very much not. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you all so much on the panel. Um, I'll open it up to all the participants uh, because I'm sure you have great insights and questions to share as well. Um, do we have anybody who wants to go first? Great, sure. Um, could we, before you uh, make your intervention, could you just in a line maybe share who you are? Uh, is it okay? It's better now. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, or yeah, still good morning. Um, my name is Katarzyna Stativa, and I represent the National Research Institute in Poland. Although my background is in law enforcement and criminology, and so soon also clinical sexology. So I really want uh, children, uh, voices of children, to be present in this debate because. Uh, um, there were already mentioned um, in the context of uh, CSAM, which is child sexual abuse material, um, scanned um, and um, yeah, on some other occasions. But um, I think there is a need to make a difference between uh, general monitoring or general scanning and scanning for this particular type of content. It is such a big difference because uh, it helps to reduce this uh, horrendous crime. And uh, there are already techniques that can be reliable, like hashes. And by hashes, I also mean experience of hotlines, uh, in hope hotlines present all over the world. And it's already experience of, I believe, more than 20 years uh, of, of, a, of this sort of cooperation. So. Um, hashes there are gathered in a in a reliable way there is three i verification uh, in the process of uh, stating if a particular photo or video is csam so it's not like a general scanning it's uh, scanning for something what has been corroborated uh, before by an expert and then on ai uh, i'm lucky enough uh, because my uh, institute is is actually working on ai project um, and we train, uh, we train our algorithms to detect CSAM in a big bunch of photos or videos. And I can tell you that this is being very successful so far. So uh, we use um, also current um, project by InHope that follows on ontology, a specific ontology. So we train algorithms uh, in a very detailed way to pick up only these materials that are uh, clearly defined in advance. So, um, and, and it's again, it, it's an experience of years of cooperation, international cooperation. And I can tell you that uh, 
that general monitoring is something very much different than scanning for a photo or video of a six month uh, old baby that is being raped. So uh, please take it into consideration in any future discussions that uh, uh, while we have obligation to, um, to, take, to take care of uh, uh, privacy and, and online safety, we first have an obligation to protect children from being harmed. And this is also deeply rooted in all the EU conventions and uh, uh, all the uh, uh, UN conventions and the EU law. So um, we have to make a we have to make a decision because for some of these children it would be too late. Um, and I will leave you with this dilemma. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that intervention and respect all the work you're doing. Thank you for sharing that experience. Um, I think one thing that I can say for everybody on the panel and in the room is that all of us are working towards online safety. And I know we're at a point where we're identifying similar issues, but looking at the solution from different lenses. So I do hope that conversations like this lead us to solutions that work for safety and privacy for everybody, including children. So thank you so much for sharing that. I really value it. Um, anybody else? Okay, there. Thank you for the great presentation. I'm Marlena Wisniak from European Center for Nonprofit Law. Um, and thank you for your intervention. Um, following up on that, I'd love to hear from you, Alishka. You mentioned the, p the potential misuse of EU regulation, then more broadly, um, how can this kind of child safety narrative can also be used as, as a slippery slope for other narratives like counterterrorism or fighting human trafficking, which are all laudable goals, which as human rights advocates, we all um, fight for. And thank you for your mention about child uh, protection. Indeed, um, online safety applies to all, especially marginalized groups. But I'd love to hear from you how um, it's not as easy, it's not a black or white kind of picture, and how these narratives can often be um, ab abused and weaponized to actually prevent encryption. Thank you so much, great question, and thank you very much for your contribution. From a position of digital rights organization, we, of course, advocate for the online safety and protection of fundamental rights of all. Um, and of course, children also have their right to be safe and to they also have equally right to privacy. And we can go into nitty gritty details on general monitoring, um, whether, you know, how these technologies work and whether there is any way how uh, general monitoring would not occur. And I think that maybe we would even disagree to some extent, but the point is that the goal is definitely the same for all of us. And especially when it comes to marginalized uh, groups, as Marlena rightly pointed out, it's a major priority for us too. Um, but I definitely find it difficult, mainly as an observer, uh, because we truly rely fully on the EDRI network in Brussels, European Digital Rights Network, who leads our work on child sexual abuse material. And I often see that precisely um, the question of children's rights is being, to some extent, um, I would say, um, I'm trying to find the right term, um, but the emphasis on that, um, even though it's a number one priority for all of us, it can be used in the debate to maybe counter-argue against opinions um, that are slightly more critical towards some technical solutions, while no one ever disputes the need to protect children and that they come first. And that often complicates and maybe becomes to some extent almost counterproductive um, because I don't think that we have any differences in terms of goals that we are trying to achieve. We all are aiming at the same outcome in the process, uh, but perhaps the means and ways and the policy solutions and regulatory solutions that we are aiming at might differ. And that's of course subject to debate and to ongoing negotiations. What is that uh, solution? And none of them will be ever perfect. And there will have to be some compromises made in that regard. But I do find this, uh, you know, dichotomy um, and more kind of um, like very straightforward black and white differences in terms of uh, when we are doing our advocacy, um, almost occasionally trying to put it in a way that we should choose the side incredibly problematic because there is no need for that. Um, um, I think we all, as I said, have the same outcome in mind. Um, 
So I don't know whether I answer your question. Um, but uh, indeed, this is a very complex and complicated topic and we need to continue having this dialogue as we have today and inform each other position and try to see each other perspective in order to achieve that successful act outcome that we are striving for and that's the highest level of protection. Thank you. Um, Vagisha and then here. Hi, thank you. Um, is this working? I don't know. Okay. Uh, hi, I'm Vagisha. I'm a PhD scholar at Georgia Tech. Um, kudos to all of you to condense all of that material into 40 minutes. I mean, it's, it's a vast thing that you've covered here. I think um, I have a comment that will lead to a question, so I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, Elishka, you mentioned about significant risk in the beginning, and I was thinking about how significant risk on any sort of online platforms are often masked by um, this concerns of national security when it comes to the governments, governments directly, right? And national security risk could be often subjective and uh, could be related to the context of which government and how they interact with it. So, and I think uh, Udbhav also mentioned about how um, harmful content is a big problem in the space. I mean, all of us agree about that. Uh, I think um, my question would be largely alluding to one, when you were talking about, and this is to everybody, when you're talking about uh, scraping of the content f to be used further on, how much of the apps that are available online actually store the data in an encrypted format? So how big is that problem of you know scraping of that data and it's encrypted, it being in encrypted format? And two, how do we think about it from a user's perspective? So what can a user do directly to um, either um, not, not solve this problem, but intervene in this problem and present their perspectives ahead? Thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, do you want Udbhav to take the question given the platform reference? And um, could I request everyone to just keep the questions brief so that more people can participate? We have only a few more minutes to go. Thank you. Sure. Uh, so on the platform front, I think uh, how big is the problem and how pervasive is the problem is an interesting one because on one angle, it depends on whose perspective you're looking at it from. If you're looking at this from the perspective of an actor that either produces or consumes child sexual abuse materials, then it's arguably a lot of them because this is how... the one would argue they communicate with each other and share information with each other, which is measures that either aren't online at all or are ways in which they are encrypted. Um, but I think that's definitely a space that needs a lot more study, uh, especially, especially going into like, what are the vectors in which these uh, like uh, pieces of information are shared and communicated with each other? Because there has been some research on how much of it is online, how much of it is offline, how much of it is natural discovery, how much of it is you have to seek out the fact that it exists kind of discovery. Um, I, but a lot of that information is both very jurisdiction specific and I think overall has not been answered to the degree that it should be. Um, on what are the things that users themselves can do? Um, I mean, broadly into three categories, right? Like one is there's reporting itself because then even on uh, other systems, the ability for a user to say, I have received or seen content that is like this and I want to tell the platform that this is happening is one route. Uh, the second route, uh, and this applies to more limited systems, is the content exists in this form and I would like to directly take it to the police uh, or to law enforcement agencies saying I have it from this user in this way and uh, this is the problem that it's creating and uh, ultimately the third is for the user and this is like something that a lot there's been a lot of research on is like intervening at the social level where you talk to your uh, like if it's somebody you know for why this is kind of problematic and you ask them to get professional psychiatric help and then like they, they essentially get treated like they have a disease. Um, uh, platforms can or cannot play a role in this. Some of them can proactively prompt you to seek help. Some of them can tell you it's a crime. There are some countries where courts have mandated that these warnings proactively be surfaced and laws too like in India. Uh, but ultimately I think uh, it's an area that needs a lot more study uh, which just hasn't happened so far. Just to very quickly add to that and I'll pass it on is that uh, all of this is by no means to say that you know platforms play a role in keeping people safer in a way that governments don't. By all means we need um, measures to make platforms more accountable including the ones that are end-to-end -end encrypted absolutely but the question is just how to do it in a way that most respects fundamental rights. Um, I'll pass it to you and then to the ladies. Uh, online, Rihanna, Sarah, if there's anything that you want to add to any question, please just raise your hand and we'll make sure you can come in. Um, 
Yeah, my, my name is Raul Plummer from uh, Electronic Frontier Finland, and um, I don't have a question, but I'd, I'd just like to respond as well to the law enforcement representative here um, that um, I, I've lost a lot of credibility in law enforcement to, to use their tools for what they actually say they use them for. For example, um, in Finland, uh, they tried to introduce um, a censorship tool. Well, they did in 2008, um, and in the end, um, it, it took a hacker to scan the secret list of the police that censorships uh, the, or censors the websites. Um, and we found out like the rationale for the tool went that uh, it has to be used like that uh, because um, the CSAM material is hosted in countries that our law enforcement doesn't have access to or I even any cooperation. Um, and there was this hacker who scanned the internet to find out the secret list. He was able to compile about 90% of that list. And we actually went through the material and had a look what's in there. Uh, first of all, it was like less than 1% was actual child sex abuse material. Um, and <coughs> the second point, which I think is even <laughs> stronger, is that um, guess the biggest country that hosted the material? It was US. After that, Netherlands. After that, UK. In fact, the first 10 countries were Western countries, where all you need to do is pick up the phone, call them to take it down. That's it. Why do they need a censorship tool? And the same goes for, for these kind of client-side scanning. I feel it's going to be abused. It's going to be used for different purposes after it goes to gambling and so on. So it's a real slippery slope, and it's been proven before that that's... That's how it goes. Thank you, and thank you very much for your comment. So I work for Epat International, which uh, some of you will know, um, we're, we're at the forefront of actually advocating for the use of targeted technology to protect children. Um, in online environments. And I absolutely, I mean, what's interesting just even about the people in this room is um, I think certainly what we're seeing is an example, and we speak for both sides, of the conversations being divided. Um, and I'm very happy I'm here, and I'm really enjoying this conversation because I absolutely believe in, in critically uh, challenging our own perspectives and views on different issues. And I've, it's been really interesting to hear, I, particularly the point about Global South and, and different jurisdictions. And it's absolutely, I think we have a system that is working, it's not perfect, and there are examples where there, there have been problems, but in general, the system is working very well, and we could give many other examples of why that is. Um, but we need to build on the existing system to expand out into other regions. One of the things I think is interesting, and this has been a key theme of the IGF, I think, for me, is this issue of trust in institutions and trust in tech. And they're very difficult to achieve. Um, they're easy to lose, they're hard to gain. It's trust in general. I think on this issue, it's at the forefront of the problem. Um, I think... One of the things I always regret is that there isn't more discussion of where we do agree, because there are areas we agree. And again, one thing that comes up when we deal with issues of trust are issues of transparency, whether that's in processes, algorithmic transparency, oversight, uh, reporting. They're not perfect, but w as, as civil society, we can call for accountability. Um, so I think that those are areas where we agree, and I do wish we were speaking a little bit more about that. In terms of the legislation and general monitoring, you're right, we're not gonna go into the details of the processes in the EU, but I do think there's a sometimes a convenient conflation of, of technology in general and specific technologies that are used for certain things. And I think um, if we talk about uh, targeted CSAM detection tools and spyware, they're not the same thing. Um, and I think sometimes there's a convenient conflation of different texts that are used for different means. The other thing, and this is very much to your point about data sets upon which these tools are trained, um, it, it's true that we need to be doing much better at understanding and having data that will, that will avoid any kind of bias in the identification of children. But just to this final point, one of the reasons um, for um, differentiating between hosting of content, uh, which is very much related to internet infrastructure, but it is shifting, um, is also that we need to talk about victim identification. That one of the reasons to take down and refer child sexual abuse material is that it gets to into processes where children can be identified. And we have decades now of experience of very successful processes um, 
whereby law enforcement are actually identifying children and disclosing on their behalf. Because we have to remember that um, child sexual abuse material is often the only way a child will disclose because children do not disclose. And one of the fallacies, I'm sorry, I will finish here, one of the fallacies in the debate about the child rights argument is often that um, we, um, we're calling for uh, uh, technical solutions as a silver bullet. Absolutely not. I think one of the things we all agree on is this is a very complex puzzle. And prevention means technology, prevention means education, prevention means safety measures, prevention means you know, uh, working with perpetrators. It's everything that we need to be doing. And we're absolutely calling for that. So I suppose it's not a question, um, but I wanted to sort of make that point. And maybe it's a question or a call to action is that we really need to be around the table together because I think there are areas where we absolutely are agreeing. Thank absolutely you. agree with that. And I, I do hope we'll have more opportunities to kind of talk on the issues that we all care about. Unfortunately, we're over time already, but I know that Rihanna has had her um, hand raised for a bit. So Rihanna, do you want to just close us up in one minute? Sure. So to, to close, I guess I'll just note that I'll emphasize something that Alishka said, which is that we know that all fundamental rights are meant to be co-equal with no one right taking precedence over any other. And how to actually implement that in practice is extremely difficult, but it applies to things like child safety as well, that are these contentious you know, horses that, that we can get stuck on. Um, and that's the topic of um, a report that I helped author, including a, with an emphasis on child rights as part of uh, the DFR Lab's recent uh, Scaling Trust on the Web report that goes into more depth into all the different ways that we need to be forward looking with regard to finding equitable solutions for the various problems of online harms. Um, I also just want to make sure to mention that when it comes to trustworthiness of institutions, we do need everybody to be holding governments accountable as well. There was recent reporting that uh, Europol had in some of the closed door negotiations over the child sex abuse regulation in the EU demanded unlimited access to all data that would be collected and have that be passed on to law enforcement so that they could look for evidence of other crimes, not just child safety care crimes. So in addition to looking to platforms to do more, we all also need everybody, child safety organizations included, to be holding governments to account and ensuring that if they are demanding these powers, that they cannot be going beyond those and using that as the tip of the spear with one particular topic to be demanding unfettered access for all sorts of crime investigations, because that goes beyond the sort of necessity and proportionality that is the hallmark of a human rights respecting framework. Thanks. Thank you. A big thank you to all the panelists, Sarah, Rihanna, Udbhav, Elishka, Reitz. Thank you for moderating online. And thank you all so very much for being here, for sharing your thoughts. And we hope all of us are able to push our boundaries a little bit and arrive at like a common ground um, that works for the best of all users online. Thank you so much. Have a great IGF.